What do you want? No, no, stay where you are. The rain is dripping off you. God's good rain, my girl, God's good rain. It's the devil's own rain, that's what it is. Lord, how do you talk, Regina? Now, what I want to talk to you about is... Do not clump about like that. The young master is lying asleep upstairs. He's asleep still. He's in the middle of the day. <laughs> well, it's no business of yours. You know, I was out of the spree last night. I don't doubt. Yes, we are poor, weak mortal, my dear. We are indeed. And the temptations of the world are many fold. But for all that, I was at my work at half past five this morning. Yes, yes. Make yourself scarce now. I'm not going to stand here as if I had a rendezvous with you. As if you had what? I am not going to have anyone find you here. So now you know and you can go. No, not till we've had a little chat. Now, I shall have finished my work down at the orphanage this afternoon and I intend to go home to Tampa tonight's boat. Bon voyage. Thank you, my girl. Tomorrow afternoon is the opening of the orphanage and there's going to be a lot of fun kick up and plenty of strong drink, you know. And no one's going to say that Jacob Engstrand can't hold off temptation when it comes his way. Oh, is that so? Yes. There's going to be a lot of fine folk tomorrow. Pastor Man doesn't expect it, you know. And what's more, he's coming today. Oh, there you are. I'm going to be precious careful that he has nothing to say against me. Mm. Ah, so that's your game, is it? Uh, what do you mean? What is it that you want to humbug Mr. Manders out of this time? Are you crazy? How about Mr. Manders? Me? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Mr. Manders has been far too kind of friend for me to do that. But what I want to talk to you about is me going home tonight. The sooner you go, the better. Yes, my dear. But I want to take you with me. You want to take... What did you say? I said I want to take you with me. No, you will never get me home with you. <laughs> we shall see about that. <clears throat> yes, you can be quite certain that we shall see about that. I, who have been brought up by a lady like Mrs. Elwing. I, who was treated almost as if I were her own child. You suppose I'm going home with you? To, to such a house as yours? Oh, not likely. What, what, the, what the devil do you mean? Are you setting up yourself against your own father, you hussy? You have often told me that I was none of yours. Ah, oh, why do you pay attention to all that? Haven't you many and many times abused me and called me names for I shame? I have never used any bad words. It doesn't matter. Besides, it was when I was all, you know, all funneled up. The temptations of the world are very full, my dear. Oh, I... It was when your mother was in a nasty temper. I had to find some way of spying my knife into her. She was only so precious gentile. Yes. Poor mother. You killed her. Of course. I have to pay for everything now, aren't I? And that leg, too. What do you mean? Pied de mouton. Is that even English? Yes. You know, you had a very good education out here, and it might stand you in good stead, Regina. What was it that you wanted me to come to town for? Uh, did you ask why a child wants to spend time with the only child, father? Uh, entire lonely widow? No, no, do not come with that tale now. Why do you want me to go? Well, if you must know, I'm thinking of starting a new line now. You've tried that so often and it has always proved a fool's errand. Well, this time, Regina, this time I've got a plan. And I swear to God Don't that... swear! Hey! All I want to say is that I put aside a tiny penny of my own into the orphanage. Have you? Well, um, all the better for you. Yes. What is that for a man to spend here in the countryside? Well, what then? Well, I'm thinking of putting the money into something that we pay. <clears throat> you know, like a eating house for the seafaring folk. Oh, heaven. A place like that? No. Not just any eating house, a high class eating house, a big sack of the farm folk. No, no, if you place where first captains and ships, first mates come along. A really classy sort of place. And what should I do there? Uh, you would just help out there. Uh, you could just, just for show, nothing too difficult. You could do exactly as you like. Yes, quite so. What? We must have women there, and that is as clear as daylight. Because some evening, we must make the place a little attractive, you know? We must have some singing and some 
dancing and stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> because remember, they are sea folk, wayfarers in the waters of life. Now, don't just stand there, Regina. What good are you going to do here? I mean, what good is the education that your Mr. Spade for going to do you? I hear that you're going to be working down at the orphanage. Is that the sort of work for you? Are you so frightfully anxious to wear out your health and you can take care of those nasty little bastards? Uh, no. Uh, no, not if things were to go the way that I want them to go. It might still happen. What might happen? Never mind. Um, is it much that you're put by then? Well, taking it all around, I should get around four or five thousand pounds. Well, that's not so bad. Yeah, pretty good to start with. Don't you need to give me any of the money? No, I'm happy if I do. Don't you need to send me as much as a dress then, just for once? Well, whatever you come to town with me, and uh, you can have all the little dresses you want, my dear. Mm. Actually, I can get that much for myself if I have a mind to. <laughs> well, it's far better to have a father's guiding hand, my dear. You know, I can get a nice house, a little house, street for hardly anything. We could make it up. Seem as though if you know what I mean. <laughs> no, 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 because I have no intention of living with you. I'll have nothing well, whatever to do with you, so now get out! Living with me? Ah, no such luck. I mean, not if you know how to play your cards, right? Look at you. Mm. What a fine little wench you've grown into these last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Well? Well? It will be long before a uh, first mate came along. Perhaps a captain? No, no, I don't mean to marry a man of that sort. Sailors have no savoir vivre. Well, I know what sailors are, I tell you, and they aren't the sort of people to marry. <laughs> Who ever said about marrying them? You can make your pay just as well, you know. You know the Englishman? The one with the big yacht? He paid 700 pounds he did. And your mama was half as pretty as you are. Get out! Get out! <laughs> you don't hit me now, are you? If you speak like that of my mother, I will hit you. Now get out! And don't bang the doors. Young Mr. Alving is asleep. It's asleep. I know, I know. It's funny how anxious you are of young Mr. Alving. Oh. I don't suppose he... Just get out and be quick about it. Not that way. Mr. Mangers is coming. Be up on the kitchen stairs. All right, all right. But ask the pastor who's coming along what a child owes to his father. For I am your father, you know. And I can prove it by the register. Good morning, Miss Edstrand. Good morning, Mr. Manders. The boat is in there? Yeah, just in. It's most tiresome, this rain every day. Ah, it's a splendid rain for the farmers, Mr. Manders. Yes, you're quite right. We town folk think so little of that. It's so pleasant to be indoors. Everything going well here, I hope? Yes, thank you. Well enough. I'm probably busy with getting ready for tomorrow. <sighs> there is plenty to do. Ah. And Mrs. Alvin is at home, I trust? She is indeed. She has just gone up to take the young master his chocolates. Ah, tell me. I did hear down on the pier that young Oswald is back. <laughs> yes, yes. He came the day before yesterday. We didn't even expect him until today. Strong and well, I hope? Yes, thank you. Although he is dreadfully tired after such a long journey, he came all the way from Paris without a stop. Uh, I fancy that he's having a sleep now, Mr. Manders, so we must talk a bit more quietly, if you don't mind. All right. We'll be very quiet. <laughs> Mr. Manders, please have a seat and make yourself at home. Thank you. Ah, that is most comfortable. I'll tell you what, Miss Edstrom. You've certainly grown since the last time I saw you. Do you think so? Mrs. Elving says, too, that I have developed. Uh, developed, uh, yes, well, uh, may maybe just a little. Uh, j just appropriately, yes. <laughs> Shall I tell Mrs. Elving that you're here? Uh, no, there's no hurry, my dear. Now tell me, my dear Regina, how has your father been getting on? Thank you, Mr. Manders. He's getting on pretty well. He came to see me the last time he was in town, you know. Did he? Well, he's always so glad when he can have a chat with you. I expect you see him almost every day. I, um, yes. Whenever I have the time, that is to say. Well, your father's not a very strong character. He needs someone who he can cling on to. Yes, he, 
He has said something on the same sort to me. He needs somebody who can guide him. Yeah. He he has mentioned it to me, but I don't know whether Mrs. Elving could do without me. Most of all, just now, when we have the new orphanage to see about. And I should be dreadfully unwilling to leave Mrs. Elving. She has always been so good to me. What a daughter's duty, my child. Of course, we'd need to see your mistress's consent first. Still, I don't know whether it would be quite the thing for a girl at my age to keep house for a single man. But, but it is your father we're talking about. They're say, Mr. Manders. But now, if it were in a good house and with a real gentleman, one whom I could feel an affection for, and really feel a position of a daughter to, yes, I should like religion. very much to live in town, Mr. Manders. Out here, it is terribly lonely. And you know yourself, Mr. Manders, what it is to be alone in the world. And though I say it, I really am both capable and willing. Don't you know any place that would be suitable for me, Mr. Manders? I? Uh, no, indeed I don't. But at any rate, Mr. Manders, don't forget about me in case you should find no, some. No, I won't forget about you, Miss Enstrand. Because if I had your... Perhaps you'd let Mrs. Alving know that I'm here. I will fetch her at once, Mr. Manders. I'm very glad to see you, Mr. Manders. How do you do, Mrs. Allen? Here I am, as promised. Always fun to. Uh, indeed, I was hard pressed to get away. What with the vestry meetings and committees? It is all the more kinder of you to come at such good time. We'll finish our business before dinner. But where is your luggage? Oh, it's down at the village shop. I'm going to stay there tonight. Can't I persuade you to stay here the night this time? No, no, no. I'll put up there as usual. It's so handy for getting on the boat again. Of course, you will do as you please. But it seems quite another thing, now that we are two old people. <laughs> you will have your little joke, won't you? But it's no wonder you're in high spirits. What with the great event tomorrow? And I hear that Oswald's back. Yes. Am I not a lucky woman? It's been more than two years since he was here last, and he's promised he'll stay the whole winter with me. Has he? Mm. Well, that is very nice of him. Because I would have thought there were many more attractions in his life in Paris or Rome, I should think. Well, he has his mother here, you see. Bless the dear boy. He still has a corner in his heart for his mother's here. Yes, it would be very sad indeed if absence and a preoccupation with such things as art were to dull the natural affections. It would indeed, but there is no fear of that with him, I am glad to say. But I am curious, though, if you would recognize him. Really? He's lying upstairs for a little while, but he'll be down shortly. Why don't you sit down, my dear friend? Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, are you sure I'm not disturbing you now? No, of course not. Okay, let's just begin. Mrs. Alvin, what are these books doing here? I'm reading them. But do you read things like this? Certainly I do. Well, do you feel any happier or better for reading material such as that? I feel they make me more self reliant Remarkable. But why? They give me an explanation or confirmation of a lot of different ideas that have come into my own mind. But what surprises me, Mr. Manders, is that, properly speaking, there is nothing at all new in these books. There's nothing more in them than what people already think or believe. The only thing is, they don't take it into account or won't admit it to themselves. Good heavens. You're not suggesting that people rip them. Indeed, I do. Well, not people in the country, surely. Well, not yes. people amongst ourselves. Well, people amongst ourselves, too. Well, maybe. <laughs> but what is your particular objection to these books, Mr. Mantis? What is my objection? You surely don't think I take any interest in productions such as these. In fact, you have no idea as to what it is that you're denouncing. I have read quite enough about them to know that I disapprove of them. Yes, but your own opinion. My dear Mrs. Alvin, there are many occasions in life when one has to rely on the opinions of others. That is the way it is in the world. But it's quite right that it is so. What would become a society otherwise? Yes, you may be right. Naturally. I understand that literature of this type is of considerable interest. And I don't blame you either for wishing to acquaint yourself with the natural tendencies that I am told are at large in the wider world, in which you have allowed your son to, to go for so long. But... But... One doesn't talk about it, Mrs. Alvin. 
One is not called upon to account for what one reads or thinks in the privacy of one's own home. Certainly not. I quite agree with you. And just think of the consideration that you owe to this orphanage, which you decided to build when your thoughts on such matter were very different from what they are now, as far as I'm able to judge. Yes, uh, it was about the orphanage that we were talking about. Ah, yes, the orphanage, yes. Well, walk warily, my dear Mrs. Alvin. See these? The deeds? Yes, here they are, all of them, and they're all in order. It's been no easy task getting them here on time, you know. I positively had to put pressure on the authorities, who can be painfully conscientious when it comes to settling matters of property. But anyway, here they are now. See here, here is the deeds of conveyance of part of the Rosenville estate known as the Slovak properties, together with the newly erected buildings thereon. The orphanage, the master's houses, and the church. And here is the legal sanction for the statutes of the institution. You see, statutes for the Captain Alvin Orphanage. Well, that seems to be in order. I thought the title of Captain was better than your husband's court title of Chamberlain. Captain seems well, less ostentatious. Yes, Mr. Manders, you seem to know best about that. And here is the certificate for the investment of the capital in the bank. See there, the orphanage's current expenses are marked there. Many thanks, Mr. Manders, but I think it would be most convenient if you took charge of them. Ah, it would be my pleasure. I think we should leave the money in the bank for the time being. I mean, the interest is not high, that's true. Four percent at six months' call. Yes, yes, Mr. Manders, you seem to know best about all of that. Yes. Anyway, I will keep an eye on it. But there is one thing in connection with this that I've often meant to talk to you about. What is that? Shall we insure the properties or not? Of course we must insure them. But wait for one moment, my dear Mrs. Alvin. Let us look into the matter a little more deeply. Everything of mine is insured, Mr. Manders. The house, its contents, my livestock, everything. Naturally, they're all your own property. I mean, I do exactly the same myself. But this is different. The orphanage is, to some degree, dedicated for higher uses. Certainly. And for my part, I've got no objections whatsoever to us insuring <coughs> ourselves against all risks. That is exactly what I think. But what about the opinion of people hereabouts? Their opinion? Well, is there any considerable body of opinion? I mean, an opinion of some account, I mean, who might take exception. What exactly do you mean by opinion of some account? Well, I'm thinking of persons of an independent, influential position, where one could hardly refuse to attach weight to their opinion. Yes, there are a certain number of people here who might take That's exception. just it, you see. There are so many of them in the town. I mean, all my fellow clergymen's congregations, for instance. And it would be so very easy for them to interpret this meaning neither you nor I had got proper reliance on divine protection. But my dear Mr. Manders, you have at all events the consciousness yes, that my mind is clear on. That's true. But we would not be able to prevent wrong and injurious interpretations of our actions. And that, moreover, could lead to a hampering effect on the workings of the orphanage. Well, if that is going to be the effect of it. Nor can I ignore the difficult, no, indeed I might say painful position that I may be placed in. In the best circles in town, the orphanage is attracting a great deal of attention. Indeed, the orphanage has really been built for the town's use. And as I have been your advisor, and I have taken charge of business matters, I'm afraid it's I that spiteful persons will attack first of all. Yes, you ought not to expose yourself to that. Nor can I ignore the, the, the undoubted attacks that will take place in certain newspapers and reviews. Say no more, Mr. Manders, that quite decides it. Then you don't wish to be insured, then? No, we will give up the idea. But supposing now something happened? One could never tell. Would you be prepared to make good the damage? No, no. I say quite plainly, I refuse to do that under any circumstances. Still, it's a serious responsibility that we're taking on ourselves, Mrs. Alvin. But do you think we can do otherwise? That's just it. We really can't do otherwise. We should do nothing that can scandalize the community. Yes. You ought not to, as a clergyman, at any rate. Well, indeed, I think we can rely on our enterprise being attended to by good fortune. One might say it beyond the special protection. <laughs> Let us hope so, Mr. Mantis. Right. We will leave the matter there, then. Certainly. 
as you wish. No insurance then. It's a funny thing you have happened to mention this today. But I've often meant to talk to you about it. Because we very nearly had a fire there yesterday. Really? It was nothing of any big consequence. Just a few wood shavings in the carpenter's workshop caught fire. What, where Enstrand works? Yes. They say he's often careless with matches. He has so many, so many anxieties. Thank heavens. I'm told he's working very hard to live a blameless life. Really? Who told you? Well, he told me so himself. <laughs> he's, a, he's a good workman, too. Yes, when he is sober. Ah, that sad weakness of his. <coughs> it's all account of his legs, so he tells me. The last time he came to see me, I was really quite touched. He came to my house and thanked me so gratefully for getting him work here where he could be with Regina again. And he doesn't see very much of her. But he assured me he sees her every day. Well, maybe he does. He feels so strongly that he needs someone beside him who can take hold of him when temptation assails him. That's the most winning thing about Jacob Enstrand. He comes to one like a helpless child, accuses himself. The last time I was talking... Mr. Sally, suppose it were really a necessity of his existence that he was with Regina again. Regina? You ought not to set yourself against him. I set myself very much against this. Besides, you know Regina has to have a post in the orphanage. But this is her father we're talking about. I know what kind of a father he has been to her. No, Regina will not go to him with my consent. You judge too hastily. It is very sad how you misjudge poor Enstrand. One would think that you were afraid. That is not the question. I have taken Regina into my charge, and in my charge she shall remain. Dear Mr. Thomas, we will not talk about this anymore. Listen, Oswald is coming down there. We will only think about him. Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you were in the office. Good morning, Mr. Manners. This is remarkable. Yes. What do you think, Mr. Manners? Well, I, I couldn't possibly say. It really is the prodigal son, Mr. Manners. My dear young friend. Well, the son came home then. Well, Oswald is thinking of the time when you were so opposed to him being a pig. Well, we're all fallible, and sometimes steps at first seem hazardous, and afterwards, well, welcome, welcome, Oswald. I may still call you Oswald. Well, what else would you think of calling me? Thank you, dear Oswald. I mean, I wouldn't want you to think I'd got any unqualified disapproval of an artist's life. Indeed, I admit, there are many, even in that profession, who keep the inner man free from harm. Let us hope so. Well, I know one who has managed to keep both the inner and outer man free from harm. Just look at him, Mr. Manders. Yes, mother dear, of course. Undoubtedly, no one can deny it. He's making quite a name for himself. Indeed. I've often seen mention of him in the newspapers, and very favourable mention too, I might add. Although I must admit, lately I've not seen his name mentioned so often. I haven't done so much painting just lately. Well, even an artist must take rest sometimes, just yes. like other people. Yes, of course, of course. But those times they're resting and preparing themselves for greater efforts. Yes, yes. A mother, will dinner soon be ready, though? In half an hour. He has a fine appetite, thank goodness. And a liking for tobacco, too. I found Father's pipe in the room Ah, upstairs. that was it! What? My nostril came in that door with the pipe in his mouth. I thought it was his father in the flesh. Really? What are you saying? Oswald takes after me. Yeah, but there was an expression. Something about the corners of the mouth that was so exactly like his father. Especially when he spoke. I don't think so, Mr. Manders. Uh, in my mind, Oswald has more of a clergyman's mouth. Well, it is true that a great many of my colleagues in the church do have similar expressions. Put down the pipe, my dear boy. You know I don't allow smoking in here. All right. I only wanted to try it because I smoked it once when I was a child. You? Yes, I remember going to Father's room one evening when he was in very good spirits. You can't remember anything of those days? Of course I remember. I, I, I remember he, Father took me on his lap and he said, uh, smoke, my boy. How could smoke? And I, and I smoked as hard as I could until the perspiration was standing in great drops on my forehead. And then, and then he laughed. 
such a hearty love. Remarkably odd thing to do. Yes. Mr. Mandas, uh, Oswald only dreamt it. No, Mother, it, it was no dream. Don't you remember it was you who took me off to the nursery where I was sick? And I remember seeing you cry. D did our father often play such tricks? In his younger days, he was full of fun. And for all that, he did so much with his life. So much that was good and useful. I mean, short as his life was. Yes, Oswald Arwen, you inherit the name of a man who was both worthy and full of energy. Let us hope it will be a spur to your energies. It ought to be, certainly. It's very good of you to come home on the day that we're going to honour his name. Oh, I could do no less for my father. And to let me have him here for so long is the best thing of what he has done. Yes, I hear you're going to be for the, here for the whole of the winter. I'm here for an indefinite time, Mr. Manders. Hmm. It's good to be home again. Yes, isn't it? You went out into the world a very young man, Oswald. I did, I did. Sometimes I wonder if I wasn't too young. No, not a bit of it. It's a pity when they are kept at home and get spoiled. It's the best thing that would happen to an only child. That is a very debatable question, Mrs. Alvin. A child's home is, and must always be, his proper place. There I agree entirely with Mrs. Batters. Take the case of your son. Oh yes, we may talk about it freely in front of him. What has been the results in his case? He is what, 26 or 27 years old? And he's never ever, ever had the opportunity of learning what a well-regulated home means. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Sanders. You're quite wrong there. Indeed. I imagine that your time abroad was practically all spent with artists. So it has. And chiefly the younger artists. Certainly. And I imagine that those gentry neither had the means for a family life nor the support of a home. There are a considerable amount of them that don't have the means to marry, Mr. Manders. That is exactly my point! But they can have a home of their own, all the same. A good many of them do, and they're very well-regulated and comfortable homes too. By a home? I'm not talking about bachelor establishments. I'm talking about a home where a man lives with his wife and children. Or with his children and his children's mother. Good heavens! What? What's Nails the matter? with his children's mother? Well, would you rather he should reject his children's mother? So you are talking about those unprincipled conditions known as irregular unions. <coughs> I've never noticed anything unprincipled about these people's lives. Are you saying that a man of any account, and a woman, can reconcile themselves to live a life like that and make no secret of it either? What else are they to do? What are they to do? I will tell you, Mr. Alvin, what they are to do. They should live apart from the very start. That's what they ought to do. That advice wouldn't have much effect on hot-blooded young folks who are in love, Mr. Manders. <laughs> Indeed it wouldn't. And to think that the authorities tolerate this, and it's allowed to go on openly. And I so little reason to be concerned about your son then, where open immorality is rampant. Indeed, one might say it's honoured. Let me tell you this, Mr. Manders. I've been a constant Sunday guest at one or two of these irregular households. On Sunday too? But never have I noticed anything that could be called objectionable. Never have I seen anything that could be called immoral. But do you want to know where I've met with immorality in artist circles? No, I do Oh, well, then I will tell you! I've met with it when someone or other of your model husbands and fathers have come out to have a bit of a look around on their own account and have done the artist of looking them up in their humble quarters. Then we had a chance of learning something, Mr. Manders, I can tell you today. These gentlemen were able to instruct us about places and things we hadn't even dreamt of. Are you saying that honorable men when they go abroad. Have you not seen when these same honourable men come home again, deliver themselves on the subjects on the prevalence of immorality abroad? Yes, of course I have. I have heard them too. Ah, oh, well, you can take their word for it. Some of them are experts in the matter, Mr. Manders. You know, to, to think that the glorious freedom of that beautiful life over there should be so besmirched. You mustn't get so heated, Oswald. You gain nothing by it. <laughs> yes, you're quite right. Besides, it's extremely not good for me. Because I'm so informally tired. Yeah, I think I'll go out for a walk before dinner. Alright. I'm sorry, Mr. Manners. It's impossible for you to understand the feeling, but it takes me that way. <clears throat> no. 
My poor boy. You may well say so. This is what it has brought him to. He called himself the prodigal son. Huh. That is only too true. Alas, only too true. And what do you say about all of this? I say that Oswald was right in every single word he said. Right? Right to hold such principles as that? In my loneliness here, I have come to the same opinions as he, Mr. Mantis. I just don't presume to enter upon such topics in conversation. Now there is no need. My boy shall speak for me. You deserve the deepest pity, Mrs. Alvin. And it is now my duty to say an earnest word to you. It is no longer your businessman and advisor, no longer your friend and your dead husband's old friend that stands before you. It is your priest that stands before you, just as he did at the most critical moment of your life. And what is it that my priest has to say to me? First, I must stir your memory. The moment is well chosen. Tomorrow is the 10th anniversary of your husband's death. Tomorrow, a memorial to the departed will be unveiled. Tomorrow, I will speak to the whole assembly. But today, Mrs. Alvin, I wish to speak to you alone. <clears throat> Very well, Mr. Manders. Speak. Have you forgotten that barely a year into your married life, you were on the edge of a precipice. You had forsaken your house and your home. And you had run away from your husband. Yes, Mrs. Alvin, ran away, ran away. And you refused to return to him despite his requests and entreaties. Have you forgotten how unspeakably unhappy I was the first year? To crave for happiness in this life is to be possessed by a spirit of revolt. What right are we to happiness? No, it is our duty, Mrs. Alvin. And your duty was to cleave to the man that you had chosen and who you were bound to by a sacred bond. You knew what sort of a life my husband was living at that time. What excesses he was guilty of. Yes, I'm well aware of what Rim used to say about him. And I should be the last person to approve of that. Supposing, of course, that Rumor spoke the truth. But it is not a wife's part to be our husband's judge. You should have found it your unbounded duty to humbly accept the cross of the higher will that lay before you. You recklessly cast off your cross, and you deserted the man whose floundering footsteps you should have supported. You imperiled your good name and reputation, and came very close to imperiling the reputation of others into the bargain. Of others? Of one other you mean? It was the height of irresponsibility you seeking refuge with me. With our priest, with our intimate friend. More on that account. You should thank God that I possess the necessary willpower to turn you from your outrageous intentions. And it was vouchsafing me to lead you back to the path of duty and back to your lawful husband. Yes. Yes, Mr. Manders, that, that was certainly your doing. I was but a humble instrument of a higher power. But is it not true that I was able to lead you back to the yoke of duty and obedience? And that that sowed the seeds of rich and happy blessings for the rest of your life? Did not your husband turn from the wrong path as a man should? And did he not after that leave a life of love and good report with you for the rest of his days? Did he not become a benefactor to the neighborhood? And did he not raise you up so that by degree you became his fellow worker in all his undertakings? And a noble fellow worker too, Mrs. Alvin. I will give you that praise. Now, I must turn to the second serious failing of your life. What do you mean? Just as you forsook your duties as a wife, so you have forsaken your duties as a mother. <laughs> you have been overmastered all your life by a reckless willfulness. You have never ever been prepared to accept any restraint. Anything in your life that seemed irksome, you felt it a will, you could just cast it off. It no longer pleased you to be a wife. So you left your husband. Your duties as a mother were irksome to you. So you sent your child to live among strangers. Yes. Yes, I did that. And that is why you are a stranger to him now. No. No, I'm you not. You are. You must be. And what 
kind of a son is if you have that anyway. Think about it seriously, Mrs. Allen. You erred grievously in the case of your husband. You acknowledge as much by erecting that memorial to him. And now you must acknowledge you have erred in the case of your son. But possible. There is still time to reclaim him from his wickedness. To turn over a new leaf and reform what's capable of being reformed. Because in very truth, Mrs. Allen, you are a guilty mother. That is what I felt my duty to say to you tonight. You have had your say, Mr. Mandus. And tomorrow you will speak in the memory of my husband. I will not speak tomorrow, but today I would like to speak to you a little, just as you have been speaking to me. Very well. No doubt you wish to put forward excuses for your behaviour? No, no, I, I just want to tell you something, I... Well? In all that you said about me, my husband, and our life after, as you put it, led me back to the path of duty. There was nothing that you knew about at first hand. Since then, you never set foot in our house. You used to be a daily companion before that. But remember, you and your husband moved out of town immediately afterwards. Yes. Yes, and you never once came out here to visit us during my husband's lifetime. It was only the business with the orphanage that obliged you to come and see me. If that is a reproach, I beg you to consider... The respect you owed us by your calling? Yes. After all, I was the wife who had run away from her husband. One can never be too careful to have anything to do with such a reckless woman. You exaggerate grossly. Yes, very well. But when you condemn my conduct as a wife, you have nothing to go than ordinary public opinion. Yes, I admit it. Well, what then? Well, now, Mr. Manders, now I will tell you the truth. I had sworn that one day you and only you would know it. Well, what will the truth be then? The truth is this. That my husband died just as reckless, as wasteful, and as extravagant as he had been his whole life. What are you saying? After 19 years of married life, just as profligate as he had been when you married us. You're describing his youthful excesses, his boisterousness, his prolific at life. That is what the doctor who attended to him called him. Uh, I don't know what you mean. It's not necessary that you should. This bewilders me. Are you saying that in your long marriage, all those years that you spent with your husband was a, a hidden abyss of misery? That and nothing else. And now you know. This, how could this be? Uh, I mean, uh, how could you conceal something like that? That is what I had to fight for incessantly, day after day. When Oswald was born, I thought I saw a slight improvement. <clears throat> but it didn't last long. And then I had to fight doubly hard. Fight a desperate fight so that no one should know what sort of a man my child's father was. You knew what attractive mannerisms he had. People could think nothing but good. He was one of those men whose mode of life had absolutely no effect on their reputation. But at last, you must know this too, Mr. Manders. Draw something more abominable happened than everything else. More abominable than what you've already told me? <clears throat> I've borne a good deal. Though I only knew too well what sort of a life he lived outside. But when the point of scandal came from within these four walls. All of that here? Here? Yes! Here! In this house! It was in there that I got the first hint of it. I had something to do and the door was ajar. And then I heard the servant come in through the garden. After a while, I heard my husband come in too. And then he whispered something to her in a low voice. 
And then I heard, I go, it, it, it still rings in my ear with what is so ridiculous and heartbreaking. I heard my own servant say, let me go, Mr. Arby. Let me be. What? Well, I mean, surely that was just levity, uh, Mrs. Arby. Nothing more than levity, believe me. I soon knew what to believe. My husband had his will with the girl. And that intimacy had consequences, Mr. Mandel. Here, in this house? This house? No, I've suffered a good deal in this house. To make him stay at home in the evening at night, I've had to play the part of boon companion in his secret drinking bouts in the room upstairs. I've had to sit there alone with him. I've had to drink with him. I've had to hop dog with him. I've had to listen to his senseless ribald talks. I've had to use brute force just to get him to bed. You were able to endure all of this? I had my boy. And I endured it all for his sake. But when the crowning insult came, when my own servant, I decided I had to put an end to it. I took the upper hand in this house with him and everybody else. I had a weapon, you see, and he dare not speak. It was then that Oswald was sent away. He was around seven and beginning to understand things and ask questions like little children would. I, I endured it all, my friend, but it seemed to me the child would be poisoned if you breathed the polluted air of this house. And that is why I sent him away. And now you know why he never set foot in this house as long as his father was alive. No one, no one knows what it meant to me. You have indeed had a pitiable experience. I could not have gone through it all if I didn't have my work. Indeed, I can boast that I have worked. All oh, the increase in the value of property, the improvements, the arrangements that my husband got the honor and glory of. Do you suppose he had anything to do with that? He who used to lie on that sofa day after day reading old official lists. Well, no, Mr. Manders, you might as well know this too. It was I that kept him up to the mark when he began his lucid intervals. It was I that had to bear the brunt of it all when he began his excesses and took to whining about his miserable condition. And this is the man you're building a memorial to? There, you see, part of an uneasy conscience. An uneasy conscience? What do you mean? I always had to feel that the truth would come out and be believed. And that is why the orphanage must exist, to silence all rumors and clear away all doubts. Not falling short in that respect, Mrs. Alwyn. I had another very good reason. I did not wish Oswald, my only son, to inherit a penny that belonged to his father. So it was Mr. Alvin's property? Yes. The amount of money which I have donated to the orphanage year after year sums up to, and I've reckoned it carefully, to what made Lieutenant Alvin a catch during his hair days. Yes, I understand. That was my purchase money. My son will get everything from me. I am determined. Back again, my own dear boy. What does one have to do in this everlasting rain? <sighs> I hear dinner's ready. So, that's good. This roll has come for you, ma'am. Thank you, I suppose it's the old for tomorrow. Mm. And dinner is ready. Yes, I I'll be there shortly. Will you drink white or red wine, Mr. Elving? Both, Miss Ingstrom. Bien, very good. I may as well help you uncork it. Here's the ode for tomorrow, Mr. Mandus. I don't know how I'm going to have the courage to give that address tomorrow. Oh, you would get too late. Yes. I suppose we should arouse no suspicions. No. And after tomorrow, this long, dreadful comedy will come to an <coughs> After tomorrow, 
I will feel like my dead husband never lived in this house. It will only be my boy and his mother. What is it, Mrs. Alvin? What's the matter? Aren't you coming in, Oswald? No, thanks. I think I'll go out for a bit. Yes, do. The weather is clearing. Regina? Yes, ma'am? I want you to go down to the laundry and help with the garlands. And I want you to be around as I might need your help. Yes, ma'am. I suppose he can't hear us. Not when the door is shut. Besides, he's going out for a walk. I'm still quite bewildered. What are we to do? What are we to do? Yes, upon my word. What are we to do? I don't know. I, I'm sure nothing serious has happened between them yet. Heaven forbid. It's still quite unseedy behaviour for all that. It's nothing but a foolish jest of Oswald. You can be sure of that. But as I said to you before, I know very little about these things. Out of the house she will go, and that thing is as clear as daylight. Yes, that is clear. But where is she to go? Where is she to go? Home to her father, of course. To whom did you say? To her... But of course, Ed Strand isn't. Good. Good, Mrs. Allen. How could this be? Surely there must be some mistake, despite everything. There was no mistake. Joanna was obliged to confess it all to me, and my husband didn't deny it. After that, there was nothing left to do but to hush it up. Yes, that was the only thing to do. The girl was sent away at once with a liberal sum of money to hold her tongue. The rest she took care of it herself when she went into town. She renewed her old acquaintance with Ainsfrank and told him a fairy tale of a foreigner who had come in the yacht. And gave him a hint, I suppose, of the money that she had. She and Ainsfrank were married off in a hurry. Why, Mr. Mantis, you married them yourself. Yes, I can't understand it. I remember quite clearly Enstrand coming to see me to arrange the marriage. He was full of contrition and accused himself bitterly for the light conduct that he and his fiancée were guilty of. Well, of course he had to take the blame on himself. The deceit of it! I never would have thought it of Jacob Enstrand. And what their marriage, eh? I will have a serious word with him, but the immorality of that marriage. How much was, was it the girl cost? It was 700 pounds. Just think of it, for a poultry, 700 pounds. To be bound in a marriage with a fallen woman. What about myself then? I let myself be bound in marriage to a fallen man. Good heavens, what are you saying? A fallen man? Do you suppose my husband was any purer when I walked with him to the altar than Joanna was when Engstrand agreed to marry her? Well, the two cases, cases are different as night and day. <laughs> Not so different after all. Yes, yes, there was a huge difference in the price paid between a paltry 700 pounds and a whole fortune. How can you compare such totally different cases? I assume that you've, you've gone to your own heart and conscience and your relatives. 
I thought you understood where my heart had strayed to at that time. If I had understood anything in the psalm thought, I would have never been a daily guest of your husband's house. Well, but this much is certain. I never consulted myself in the matter at all. Still, you consulted those nearest and dearest to you, which was only proper. Your mother, your two aunts. Yes, the three of them settled the whole matter to me. It seemed incredible how they said it would be sheer folly to reject such an offer. If only my mother could see what such fine prospects has led to. Well, nobody can be responsible for the result. But one thing is clear. The match was made in complete conformity with law and order. Law and order! I often think it is this law and order that is the cause of the misery in the whole world. That's a very witty thing of you to say, Mrs. Alvin. That may be so. But I will not give importance to those duties and obligations anymore. I cannot. I must struggle for my freedom. Uh, what do you mean? I ought never to have conceived what sort of a life my husband led. But I didn't have the courage to do otherwise. I was coward enough for that. Coward? If people had known what had happened, they would have said, well, of course the man would go astray when he has a wife who has run away from him. Well, there would be a certain justification for saying so. I was the woman I ought. I would have taken Oswald into my confidence, and I would have said to him, Listen, my boy, your father was a dissolute man. Mr. Self. And I would have told him everything that I have told you today, from beginning to the end. You almost shock me sometimes, Mrs. Alvin. Yes, yes, I know. I, I shock myself sometimes, too. I'm covered enough for that. Can you call it cowardice that you simply did your duty? Remember that a child needs to love and honour his father and mother. <coughs> Let us not talk in such general terms, Mr. Manders. The question we must ask is, ought Oswald love and honour Mr. Alvey? But you are a mother. Isn't there something in your heart that prevents you from shattering your son's ideals? What about the truth, then? Well, what about ideals? Uh, ideals, ideals. You ought not to spurn ideals, Mrs. Alvey. They have a nasty way of avenging themselves cruelly. You take Oswald's case, he has very few ideals. But one thing I have seen, his father is something of an ideal to him. Yes, you are right there. And the image that you've created in your son's mind is because of your encouragement and your letters. Yes, I was swayed by the false sense of duty and consideration for others. That is why I lied to my son year after year. What a coward I have been. You have created an image in your son's mind. And that is something you should not undervalue. Who knows if that's such a desirable thing after all. But I'm not going to encourage any goings on with Regina. I'm not going to let him get the poor girl into trouble. That would be frightful. But if only, if only I knew if he meant it seriously. And if it would mean happiness to him. What do you mean? No, 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 it's impossible. No, no, what do you mean? If I were not such a coward, Mr. Manders, I would say to him, marry her, or make some sort of an arrangement with her. <coughs> Just let there be no deceit in the matter. Are you suggesting something so abominable? So unheard of as a union between those two? Unheard of, you say? Tell me honestly, Mr. Manders, don't you suppose there are many married couples out here in the country who are as nearly related as they are? I don't know what you mean. Indeed, you do. Well, I suppose you mean well. It is true that family life is not as stainless as it should be. But as to this kind of thing that you're hinting at, well, it's impossible to say with any certainty. Here, on the other hand, for you, as a mother, to allow your... I am not willing to allow it. That is just what I was saying. No, because you are a coward, as you say. But supposing now that you weren't a coward, indeed, what a revolting union that would be! But, Mr. Manders, we are all descendants of a union of such a description. I am not going to discuss that question with you anymore, Mrs. Alvin. You are clearly not in the right frame of mind for that. But for you to dare to suggest it was... I will tell you what I mean by that. I am frightened and timid because I'm obsessed with the presence of ghosts and I can never be rid of them. The presence of what? Ghosts! <laughs> oh, 
when I saw Oswald and Pacino in there. It was like seeing ghosts before my eyes, Mr. Mandis. I am half inclined to think we are all ghosts. It's, it's not only what we inherit from our fathers and our mothers that is there in us, but old sorts of old dead ideas and beliefs and things of those kinds. They are not alive in us, but they are there, dormant all the same, and we can never be rid of them. We are all surrounded by ghosts, Mr. Mantis, and we are all so miserably afraid of the light. All of us. This is the result of your reading, is it? Fine fruit that has borne. What subversive, horrible information that has given me. You are wrong there, my friend. It was you who made me think. I? You sent me back to my husband! By forcing me to submit to my duty and my obligations. By telling me what was right and just what my whole soul revolted against. That is what led me to examine your teachings critically. I, I only wanted to unravel one knot in them, Mr. Manders. But the moment I got that unraveled, your whole fabric came to pieces. Is that all I achieved for the hardest struggle of my life? I call it the most disgraceful defeat of your life. It was my greatest victory, Helen. Victory over myself. You were the wrong. A wrong to both of us. A wrong. A wrong for me to entreat you as a wife to go back to your lawful husband. When you came to me half distracted, crying, saying, Here I am, take me. Was that a wrong? I think it was. I don't know each other anymore. Not now at all events. Even in our most secret thoughts, I have never thought of you as anything but the wife of another. Do you believe what you say? Helen. One so easily forgets one's own feelings, Mandels. Not I. I am the same that I always was. But let us not talk about the old days anymore. You are up to your eyes with meetings and businesses and committees. And here I am, fighting with ghosts, both within me and around me. Well, I can help you get the better of the ghosts around you. But after what you've told me tonight, I cannot conscientiously allow that young defenseless girl to remain in this house for a moment longer. Don't you think we could get her settled? By a suitable marriage, I mean. Undoubtedly, that would be the best thing for Regina. But I don't know anything about things like that. And Regina developed early. Yes, didn't she? Mm -hmm. I remember quite clearly remarking how she had developed her bodily at the time I was preparing her for confirmation. But still, she should go home under the protection of her father. But of course, Enstrand is not her father. How could he of all men conceal that from me? I beg your pardon. <coughs> it's you, Enstrand. <coughs> None of the maids were about, so I could deliver you walking in. That's all right. Please come in. Yes, ma'am. Did you want to speak to me? No, ma'am. It's Mr. Manders I want to speak to. Oh, do you? You wish to speak to me, do you? Yes, sir. Well, may I ask what it is you wish to speak about? Well, sir, it's like this. You see, we've been paid off now. Many thanks to you, Mrs. Alvin. And now that the work is quite finished, I thought it would be nice if all of us who've been working so honestly would come together for some prayers this evening. Prayers? Oh, if it isn't agreeable to you, then uh, oh, certainly. I'll be a practice of saying a few prayers there myself each evening. Have you? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, just now and then. A little edification, so to speak. But I am only a common man and have the gift of us. And since Mr. Mander is in, is in town, I thought perhaps... Look here, Enstrand. There's a question I just need to ask you first. Are you in a proper frame of mind for this? Is your conscience free and unclear? Heaven, have mercy on me, a sinner! 
My conscience is worth us speaking about. But that is just what we must speak about. Now will you answer my question? My, my conscience? Well, it's uneasy sometimes. Ah, uh, there we have it. Now, without any concealment, will you tell me what your relationship is with Regina? Mr. Mandus. Leave it to me. It's Regina. Good Lord, how you frightened me, sir. Oh, there's nothing wrong with Regina, is there? Let us hope not. But what is your relationship to Regina? Well, you pass us our father, don't you? Well, sir, you know what happened between me and my poor Joanna? Now, without any distortion of the truth, your late wife made a full confession to Mrs. Alvin before she left her service. What? She mean to say, did she do that after all? Yes, you see, it's all out in the open now, Mr. Alvin. <clears throat> she mean to say she, who gave you a promise and solemn oath, went ahead and... Did she give you an oath? Well, no, she only gave me a word, but as seriously as a woman could, you know? How could you conceal this from me? I have had complete and absolute faith in you. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, sir. <clears throat> but did I deserve it? Haven't I always tried to help you in every single way that I could? Well, answer me, is that not so? Indeed so, sir. And this is the way you came By causing me to make false entries in the church register and holding back information from me for years that you should have given for your own sense of the truth. Your conduct instrument has been absolutely outrageous. And from today, our relationship is at an end. Yes, uh, I can see that's what it means. Because how could you justify what you did? Uh, was a poor girl supposed to go and increase a load of shame by talking about it? I mean, just suppose, sir, for a moment that your reverence was in the same predicament as my poor Joanna? I? I, I don't mean the same predicament. I mean, suppose there was something that your reverence was ashamed of in the eyes of the world, so to speak. We met should not judge a poor woman too hardly, Mr. Manders. But I'm not doing that. This is you that I'm blaming. Will your reverence grant me permission to ask you a question? Ask away. Uh, wouldn't you say it's right for a man to raise up the poor? Of course it is. And isn't a man bound by his word of honor? Certainly, but what do you think? At the time when Joanna had a misfortune with this Englishman, or was it an American? Forgetting. Well, it was then that she had come to town. You see, she had rejected me a couple of times before. She only had eyes for good looking men those days, and I, well, I had his leg. Uh, your reverence will remember how I had ventured into this darting salon where seafaring men were reveling in uh, intoxication and drunkenness, as they say, and how I tried to exhort them away from their evil ways, and uh, that's when I. <coughs> yes, 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 the ruffians threw you down the stairs. You've told me about that incident before. The affliction to your leg is a credit to you. Oh, sir, I don't want to gain credit for it. But what I want to say is that it was then that she had come, and with tears in her eyes and gnashing of the teeth, she confided in me. It went to my heart a bit, sir. It did. Did it really? Well, what happened then? Uh, well, I said, the American is roaming in the high seas he is, and you, Joanna, you have committed a sin and are a fallen woman. But here stands Jacob Engstrom, I said, on two strong legs. Of course, I was speaking in a metaphor as well. Yes, yes, get on with it with you. Well, uh, uh, that's how I rescued her, by making her my lawful wife, so that no one should know how recklessly she had carried on with a stranger, sir. Well, that was all very kindly done. But how can you justify taking the money? Money enough, not a penny, sir. But I was told that Oh, yes, I do remember. There was some trifle amount of money it's coming back to me now. But I didn't want to know anything about it. In fact, I said, Fie on the matter of righteousness, it is the price of your sin. And as for the stranded gold, or as it was notes as it were, we shall throw it on the American's face. But alas, the American had disappeared into the stormy seas. What's well, that? How it was, I understand. Yes, it was, sir. And that's when Joanna and I decided that the money should go to the bringing up of the child. And that's what became of it. And, and I can give an amount of every single penny, sir. That puts a completely different complexion on the whole affair. Yes, sir, that's how it was. And I made bold to say that I have been a good father to Regina. But as far as I could be, after all, I am a poor little mortal, sir. There, there, good fellow. Yes, I made bold to say that I have been a good father. 
and I made my Joanna a loving and careful husband. Uh, as the Bible says, we ought. But it never occurred to me to go to your reverence and claim credit for it or boast about it just because I did one good deed. No, 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 sir. Not Jacob Engstrom. Because when Jacob Engstrom does a good deed, he holds his tongue. But, unfortunately, it doesn't often happen. And I know that only too well, sir. Because when I do come to see your reverence, I only have trouble and wickedness to talk about. Because I say now, and I shall say it again, conscience, conscience can be hard on us sometimes. Jacob Enstrand, give me your hand. Oh, oh no, sir. Nonsense. There it is. Thank you, sir. And may I beg your pardon, sir? On the contrary. It is I that should beg your pardon. Oh, no, sir. No. And I do it from the bottom of my heart. And I wish you to forgive me for ever having misjudged you. Oh. And if there's anything I can ever do to repay you... Do you mean that, sir? You would give me the greatest pleasure. Well, uh, you can do it right now, you know. You see, uh, I'm thinking of using the honest money that I've been saving up into establishing a sort of sailor's home in town. Have you? Uh, you. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, as a sort of refuge, as it were. There are many fallen temptations lying over sailors' men when they roam about a shore. Uh, but in this home of mine, uh, my idea is that they will have some parental care looking after them. <laughs> now, what do you think of that, Mrs. Alvin? Uh, I may not have much uh, to begin such a work with, uh, and heaven might prosper it. And if I found a helping hand stretched out, perhaps... Yes, quite so. We will talk about it later. Your project attracts me enormously. But in the meantime, I want you to go down to the orphanage and make tidy. And light the candles so that the place may seem a little solemn. And then we will have some edifying time together. For now I know you are in a proper frame of mind. I believe I have himself, truly. Uh, goodbye, Mrs. Mangus, and thank you for your kindness. Mrs. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I went a little bit too much. I can see that. And uh, please do take care of Regina for me. Poor Joanna's child. It's extraordinary how she's drawn into my life. And she holds me by the heartstrings she does, sir. <sighs> Well, what do you think of him now, Mrs. Alvin? That was quite some story that he gave us. <laughs> Indeed it was. It just shows you how carefully you've got to be in condemning your fellow man. <laughs> but at the same time, it gives one an immense pleasure to know that one was mistaken. Don't you think so? <laughs> what I think is you are, and always will be, a big baby, Mr. Mantis. I? <laughs> yes. And I would very much like to give you a hug. Oh, no, 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 no. what a night, dear. Yeah. <laughs> no, you needn't be afraid of me. You have very extravagant ways of expressing yourself sometimes, Mrs. Alvin. No, now I must go. Uh, and keep an eye out for Oswald. I shall be back presently. Goodbye. Oswald, are you still sitting at the table? I'm only finishing my smoke. I, I thought you had gone out for a walk. In weather like this? <laughs> Wasn't that Mr. Manders who went out just now? Yes, he's gone over to the orphanage. Oh. Oswald, dear, you must be careful with that liquor. It, it is strong. It's a good protective against the damp. Wouldn't you rather come in here? All right, I'll come in. Yes. One drop more. Yeah. Well, 
Where's the parson gone? I, I just told him. He told him he's, he's gone over to the orphanage. Oh, so you did. You mustn't sit so long at the table, Oswald. But it's so nice and cozy, Mother dear. Think what it means to me to have come home, to sit at my mother's own table, and to enjoy the charming meals she gives me. My dear, dear boy. What else is there for me to do here? I have no occupation. No occupation? Not in this ghastly weather, I don't. When there isn't a wink of sunshine. <coughs> Not to be able to work, it's just... Maybe you shouldn't have come home. Oh, yes, Mother, I had to. Because I would rather give up the happiness of having you here with me than have you feel... Tell me, me, Mother, is it really such a great happiness for you to have me at home? Can you ask me that? I should have thought it was the same to you whether I were here or away. Do you have the heart to say that to your mother, Oswald? But you've been quite happy living without me so far. Yes. Yes, I have lived without you. That is true. Mother, may I sit on the couch beside you? Of course, my dear boy. Now I must tell you something, Mother. What? I can't bear it any longer. Bear what? What do you mean? Uh, uh, both yesterday and today I've tried to push my thoughts away from me to free myself from them. What is it, Oswald? And ever since I've, and since I've not been at home, I couldn't write to you about it. And, and, and I'm trying to free myself, but I just can't. Speak plainly, Oswald. Sit still, mother. Sit still. And I will try and tell you. I've made a great deal of the fatigue I felt after my journey to come all the way till here to... But what of the fatigue? That isn't what the matter is, Mother. It's it's so ordinary fatigue. It's 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 something. You're not in Oswald's room. Sit still, Mother. Do take it quietly, Mother. I'm not exactly ill. Not ill in the usual sense, Mother. It is my mind that is broken down, gone to pieces. I shall never be able to work anymore. No. No, Oswald, it isn't true, Oswald. I shall never be able to work anymore. Never. Never. I'm living death. Mother, can you imagine anything so horrible? No. Oswald, how has this terrible thing happened to Oswald? That is just what I cannot possibly understand. I've never lived recklessly. You must believe that of me, Mother. I've never done that. No, I haven't a doubt of it, Oswald. But this comes upon me all the same. This terrible disaster! It is nothing but overwork, Oswald. That, that is all it is. I thought so too at first, but it isn't so. Tell me all about it. When did you first feel anything? It was just after I'd been home last time. And I'd gotten back to Paris. I began to feel the most violent pains in my head. Mostly at the back. It was as if a tight band of iron was pressing from my neck upwards. And then? At first I thought it was nothing, but it was those headaches I used to be so much troubled with while I was growing up. Yes, yes. I soon saw that I couldn't work any longer. I would try and start some big new picture, but it seemed as if all my faculties had forsaken me. As if all my strengths were paralyzed. I couldn't even manage to collect my thoughts. My head seemed to swim. Everything went round and round. It was a horrible feeling. At last, at last I sent for a doctor. From him I learned the truth. In what way do you mean? He was one of the best doctors there. He began to describe what I was feeling. And he started asking me a whole heap of questions that had nothing to do with the matter. I couldn't see what he was driving at. And then? At last, I remember him saying, You have the canker of disease practically from your birth. 
The actual term he used was verb eaten. What did he mean by that? I couldn't understand either, mother. And so I asked him for a clearer explanation, and that's when the oath said accept. What did he say? He said, the sins of the fathers are visited on the children. Sins of the fathers? Yes. The just, sins of the fathers? Yes. Just imagine. Naturally, I assured him what he thought was wrong, but do you think any, he, he paid any heed to me? No! He persisted in his opinion. It was, it was only when I got out your letters that referred to Father and I translated all the passages. Yeah. Then he had to admit he was on the wrong track. And then I learned the truth. The incomprehensible truth. I ought to have nothing to do with the happy, joyous life I lived with my comrades. So it was my own fault, Mother. No, no, Oswald, Oswald, it wasn't your fault, Oswald. Don't believe that, Oswald. There was no other explanation of it possible. That is the most horrible part of it, Mother. My whole life, it can't be improved just because of my own imprudence. You know, all that I wanted to do in the world, not to then think of it anymore. Not to death think of it. If only I could live my life all over again. If only I could have do what I've done, Mother. <laughs> if only it had been something I'd inherited. Something I could not help. But instead of that to have disgracefully, thoughtlessly, foolishly thrown away one's happiness. One's health, one's future, everything in the world. One's life. Oswald. No. no. Oswald, things are not as desperate as they as you think, Oswald. No, no, they're not. Oswald. You don't know. I think, Mother, that, that I should bring all this sorrow upon you. Do you know? Many a times I've almost hoped and wished you didn't care so much for me. Hi, Oswald. My only son, the only thing I care about in the whole world. Yes, I know. I know that is so. When I'm at home, I know that it's true, and that's, that's the hardest part of it for me. And now I know all about it. We won't stop thinking about it long at a time. I, I can't keep thinking about it. Let's have something to drink. To drink? What do you want, us? Anything you like. I think there's some, there's some punch in the house. Yes, but, but Oswald, I Don't must... tell me I mustn't, Mother. Please be nice. I need something to drown these gnawing thoughts and... How gloomy it is here. This incessant rain goes on week after week. Never a ray of sunshine. I don't remember seeing the sun once when I've been at home. Oswald, are you thinking of going away from me? I'm not thinking about anything. I can't think about it. Did you ring, ma'am? Yes, let us have the lamp in. In a moment, ma'am. Oswald, don't keep anything away from me. Thank you all, mother. Seems to me I've told you a good lot. Haven't I? <laughs> Regina. You might as well bring us a small bottle of champagne. Yes, ma'am. That's right. I knew my mother wouldn't let her son go thirsty. My boy, how could I refuse you anything now? Is that true, mother? Do you mean that? Mean what? That you couldn't deny me anything. Oswald? Shall I open the bottle? What did you mean when you said I could refuse you nothing? Let us have a glass first. <coughs> or two? Not for me. Well, for me then. Now tell me. Tell me this. 
thought you and Mr. Manders were so strange. So quiet at dinner. Did you notice that? Yes. Mother, tell me, what do you think of Regina? What do I think of her? Yes. Isn't she splendid? Now, Oswald, you don't know her like I do. What of that? If Regina was too long at home, I should have taken her under my charge soon. Yes, but isn't she splendid to look at? You don't know her like I do, Oswald. She has many serious faults. Yes, but what of that? But I am fond of her. I have taken her under my charge, and I would really not like her to come to any harm. Mother, Regina is my only hope of salvation. What do you mean? I can't go on bearing all this agony of mine alone. Bear what? Don't you have your mother to help you bear it, Oswald? I thought so too. That's why I came home to you. But it's no use. I see that it isn't. I cannot spend my life here. Oswald! I must live a different sort of life, mother. So I shall have to go away from you. I, I really don't want you watching it. Oswald, as long as you're sick like this, my dear boy, I... If it was only a matter of feeling ill, I would stay with you, mother. You're the best friend I have in the world. Yes. Yes, I am that time I'm not Oswald. <laughs> With all the storm, the regret, that remorse, what? and that deadly fear. Fear? Oh, that horrible fear. Fear of what, Oswald? What don't you ask know? me any more about it. I don't know what it is. It's something that takes over my system and I can feel it in every cell of my... What do you want? I want my boy to be happy. That is what I want. He, he mustn't brood over anything. A large bottle of champagne. Mother? You, you think we country people don't know how to live? Isn't she splendid to look at? What a figure. And the picture of help. Sit down, Oswald, and let us have a quiet talk. <clears throat> you don't know, Mother. I owe Regina a little payback. You? It was something quite innocent, a little thoughtlessness. Call it what you like. Anyway, the last time I was at home, yes, she used to often ask me questions about Paris and the life there. And I remember saying to her one day, wouldn't you like to go there yourself? And then? And she blushed. And she said, yes, I would like to very much. I said, OK, it might be managed or something of that sort. And then? But the day before yesterday, she, I asked her if she was so happy that I was at home for so long. And, and she looked so queerly at me. And. And then she asked, what is to become my trip to Paris? Her trip? Then I got it out of her that she had taken the whole thing seriously and had set herself to learn French. So that was why? Mother, listen. When I saw this handsome, splendid, fine young girl standing there in front of me, I'd never paid any attention to her. But now when she stood there with open arms ready for me to take her I in, thought. then I realized that my salvation lay in her, for, for I saw the joy of life in her, mother. The joy of life is their salvation. Excuse me for being so long. I have to go to the cellar. Bring another glass. The mistress's glass is there, sir. Yes, but fetch one for yourself. Do you wish me to, ma'am? Fetch the glass to Gina. Notice how much she walks. <laughs> so firmly and confident. It cannot be, Oswald. It is settled. There's no use denying it, and, and there's no use forbidding it. No, Oswald. Sit down, Regina. Sit down. Oswald, what was it that you were saying about the joy of life? Mother, the joy of life. You don't know very much about that here. I shall never realize it here. Not even when you're at home with me. Never at home. But you can't understand that. Yes. Yes, I think I do understand you now. That and the joy of work. They really are the same thing at bottom. But you don't know very much about that either. Perhaps you're right. Tell me more, Oswald. Well, all I mean is that people here br are brought up to believe that Work is a curse, and a punishment for sin, and that life is a state of wretchedness, and, and the sooner we can get out of it, the better. Yes, and we quite consciously make it so. But the people over there will have none of that. There is no one over there who believes doctrines of that kind any longer. 
Over there, the mere fact of being alive is a matter of exultant happiness. Mother, have you noticed how everything I have painted is upon the joy of life? Always upon the joy of life. Unfeelingly. There's happiness there, and sunshine, and a holiday feeling, and people's face beaming with happiness. That is why I'm so afraid to stay at home here with you. Afraid? Oh, what are you afraid of here with me? I'm afraid that all these feelings that are so strong in me would degenerate into something ugly here. Is that what you think will happen? I'm certain it would. Even if one lived the same life here as over there, it would never really be the same life. I see it now. I see it how it all happened. What do you see? I see it now for the first time. And finally, I, I can speak. Mother, I, do, I don't understand you. Perhaps I had better go. No, stay. For now, I can finally speak. Now, my boy, you will know the truth. Oswald, Regina. Well, and... my friends, we did have an edifying experience down at the orphanage. So have we. Enstron shall have his sailors home, and Regina will go home and help him. No, Mr. Manders. You, in here, with a wine glass in your hand. I beg your pardon. Regina is going away with me, Mr. Manders. Going away with you? Yes, as my wife. Good heavens! It's not my fault, Mr. Manders. Or else she stays here if I stay. Here? I'm amazed at you, Mrs. Harvey. Neither of those things will happen. For now, I can speak openly. But you won't do that. No. No! No! Yes, I can and I will. And without destroying anyone's ideas. Mother, what is it that's been conceived from me? Mrs. Elving, they're shouting outside. What's the matter? Where does that come from? The orphanage is on fire! On fire! Father's orphanage! The whole place is in flames! That fire is judgment on this house of sin! And no insurance. <laughs> <laughs> gone into the garden. This has been one of the most terrible nights of my life. Oh, isn't it a shocking misfortune, sir? Isn't it, sir? But I, I dare not even think of that. But how can it have happened? Well, how would I know? I suppose you're going to blame me just like your father did. What did he do? He's driving me crazy, that's what he's doing. Mr. Manders! Mr. Manders! Have you followed me here? Oh, yes, sir. Great heavens. God help us all. What a dreadful thing, sir. How the brand it was a cause of it all, don't you see? Now we've got the old fool. And to think it's my fault that Mr. Manders should be the cause of such a thing. I assure you, Enstrand. But there was no one else carrying the light there except you, sir. Yeah, so you say. But I have no recollection of carrying a light in my hand. But I saw quite distinctly, Your Reverence. Take a candle, snuff it with your fingers, and throw away the burnt wick among the shavings, sir. Quite distinctly. Just don't no, understand it. I'm not in the habit of snuffing out candles with my fingers. Indeed, he was not like you to do that, sir. Who would have thought it been such a dangerous thing to do, sir? Well, yeah, how would I know? Uh, and uh, you hadn't even shown it either, had you? No. no. You heard me say that. You hadn't even shown it, and then you went and set light to the whole place. <gasps> 
Lord, sir, what bad luck? Yeah, you could say that again, Enstrom. And to think that it should happen to such a charitable institution that would have been of service to both town and country, so to speak. The papers aren't going to be very kind to your reverence, I expect. Yes, that's just what I was thinking. That's almost the worst thing about this. Horrible accusations. It's too horrible to think about. Can't get you away from the fire. Ah, there you are, Mrs. Owen. You will not have to give your address tomorrow at all events, Mr. Mendes. But I would gladly have given that address. Might as well have happened. And this orphanage would have come to no good. You don't think so? Do you? Well, it's certainly an extraordinary piece of bad luck. We will only talk about it as a business matter now. Are you waiting for Mr. Mendes next time? Uh, yes, I am. Sit down then as you wait. Uh, no, thank you. I, I would rather stand. I suppose you're going by the boat? Yes, it leaves in about an hour. I don't want to hear a word of this anymore. I have something else to think about now. Mrs. Alwyn? Later on, I will give you the power of attorney and you can do exactly as you please. Yes, it my pleasure. Although, I'll have to change the whole inheritance aspect. Do exactly as you please. The whole thing is a manner of indifference to me now. Help me. You will think of my sailor's home, won't you, sir? Yeah, yes, sir. But that certainly will be a consideration. Yes. Consideration? Indeed, I'm not sure how much longer I will be involved with this. Whether public opinion will force me to retire. It all depends on the outcome of the investigation into the cause of the fire. And one can never tell the outcome of that beforehand. Uh, indeed, one can, sir. Because here stands I, uh, Jacob Engstrom. Quite so, but... And Jacob Engstrom isn't one to deserve a worthy benefactor in the hour of need, as the saying goes. Yes, but how could you do that? You might say, I am an angel of salvation, so to speak, sir. Huh? No, 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 I could never accept that. No, well, that's how it shall be. You know, I know someone who's taken someone else's name on their shoulders before. I do. Jacob. You are one in a thousand. Thank you, sir. Your sailor's home is secure with me. You can rely upon that. <laughs> Great, sir. Now you must go. And I'll tell you what. We will travel together. Oh. Okay. Come along, you hussy. You shall be as comfortable as a yolk in an egg. Merci. Goodbye, Mrs. Alvin. And may the spirit of law and order speedily enter into this house. Goodbye, Pastor Mandus. Oh, goodbye, my dear. And if anything should happen to you, you know where Jacob Engstrom is going to be. Little Harbour Street. <laughs> um, and the home for the sailors should be called the Alvin Home. What house was he talking about? It was some home that he and Pastor Mendes wanted to start. It'll be burnt up just like this one. Why do you say that? Everything will be burnt up. Nothing will be left in the memory of my father. Here I am, being burnt up too. You mustn't have stayed out there so long, Oswald. I almost believe you're right. And aren't you tired, Oswald? Don't you want to go to sleep? No, no, not to sleep. I never sleep. I only pretend to. That'll come soon enough. You are really ill, my darling boy. Is Mr. Elving ill? Shut the doors. Huh? Shut the doors! Shut the doors! Shut the doors, Regina! There. There, it's all right. Now, now I will sit here beside you. It's all right. Regina, you must always stay near me, Regina. You must give me a helping hand. Won't you do that, Regina? Uh, I don't understand. A helping hand? Yes, when there's a need for it. Because what? Don't you have a mother to give you a helping hand? You! No, mother, you will never give me the kind of helping hand I mean. You. <laughs> After all, you have the best, right? Why don't you call me by the Christian name, Regina? Why don't you say Oswald? I did not think that Mrs. Elving would like it. You will soon have the right to do that, Regina. 
Sit down here beside us. And now, my boy, now I will take the burden off your mind. You, mother? Yes. Oh, you call remorse and self-reproach. And you think you can do that? I can do it now. A little while ago, you were talking about the joy of life. And what you said shed a new light in my whole life. I don't in the least understand what you mean, mother. You should have known your father in his young army days. He, he was full of the joy of life, I can tell you that. Yes, I know. It gave me a holiday feeling just to look at him. Full of irrepressible energy and exuberant spirits. So what then? Well, then this boy full of the joy of life. For he was only a boy then. Had to make his home in a second-rate town that had none of the joy of life to give to him. Only dissipations. He had to come out here and live an aimless life. He only had an official post. He had no work worth devoting his own whole mind to. He had only an official routine to attend to. He didn't have a single companion capable of appreciating what the joy of life meant. Only idlers and drunkards. Mother. And so, and, and so the inevitable happened. What was the inevitable? You said so yourself. What would happen in your case if you stayed here so long? Do you mean by that that father was just a Your father did not find an outlet for the overmastering joy of life that was in him. And I brought no holiday spirit into his home either. You did? I was, I was told about duty and things of that kind for so long. Everything turned upon duty. My duty, his duty. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I made your poor father's home unbearable to him also. Why? Why didn't you say anything about this in your letters? I didn't know I could talk to you about these things. You were his son. What way did he look at it then? I only saw it as the one thought. That your father was a depraved man before you were even born. Had as much right in this house as my own son had. Regina. I? Yes. And now you both know. So m my mother was one of that sort too. No, no, Regina. Your mother had many good qualities. Yes, but. She was one of that sort all the same. I I even thought so myself sometimes, but Then if you please, Mrs. Alving, may I have permission to leave at once? Do you really wish to, Regina? Yes, indeed, I certainly do. Of course, you'll do as you like. But I don't think, Regina, you should... Leave now? Regina, this is your home. Can I see Mr. Alving? No, of course, I can't say Oswald now. But that is not how I thought it would become allowable. I haven't been open with you, Regina. No, I can't say that you have. If... If I had known that, that Oswald was ill, and now that there can never, never be anything serious between us. Oh, no, I, I really, I can't stay here in the country and wear myself out looking after invalids. Not even for the sake of someone who has such a close claim on you, No, Regina. indeed, I can't. A poor girl must make some use of her youth. Otherwise, she may easily land herself out in the cold before she even knows where she is. And I have got the joy of life in me too, Mrs. Elway. Yes, unfortunately. But don't throw yourself away, Regina. What's going to happen will happen. 
if Oswald takes after his father, then it's just as likely that I take after my mother. May I ask, Mrs. Elway, whether Mr. Manders knows this about me? Pastor Manders knows everything. Well, then the best thing I can do is to get away by the boats as soon as I can. Mr. Manders is such a nice gentleman to deal with. It has certainly seems to me that I have just as much right to some of that money as that Mr. So horrid carpenter. Here, you may as well have raised me like a gentleman's daughter. That would have been more appropriate. Oh, well, never mind now. I dare say that someday I shall be drinking champagne with gentlefolk after all. If you ever need a home, Regina, come to me. No, thank you, Mrs. Elway. Mr. Mander takes an interest in me, I know. And things should go so very badly with me. You know, one house at any rate where I shall feel at home. Where is that? In the Elving home. No, no, Regina, that would be a ruin. Do not go there. Rubbish! Please, no, Regina. Listen. Has she gone? Yes. I think it's all wrong. Oswald, has it been a great shock to you? Oh, well, this is my father, do you mean? Yes, about your poor father. I'm afraid it must have been too much for you. What makes you think that? Naturally, it has taken me by surprise, but I don't know if it matters much to me. It doesn't matter that your own father's life was such a terrible disaster. Of course, I can feel sympathy for him, just as I would for anyone else, but... No more than you that! Know. For your own father! Father, father, father! I never knew anything about my father. I only know that he once made me sick. That is dreadful to think of, I know. But surely a child should feel some sort of an affection to his father, no matter what happens. When the child has nothing to thank his father for. When he has never known him. Do you really cling to that antiquated superstition? You, who is so broad-minded in other things? You call it nothing but a superstition. Yes, yes, it is one of those beliefs that are put into circulation in the world. Ghosts of beliefs. Yes, you might call them ghosts. Oswald, then, then you don't love me either, Oswald. You, I know. At any rate. You know me. Is that all? And I know how fond you are of me. And I ought to be grateful to you for that. Besides, you can be so useful to me now that I'm ill. Yes, yes, can't I, Oswald? I could almost bless your illness as, as, as it has brought you home to me. For I can see now that, that, that you're not my very own yet. You must be one. Oh, that is a way of talking, Mother. You must remember I'm a sick man now. I can't concern much myself with anyone else. I have enough to do thinking about myself. I will be very good. And patient. And cheerful too, Mother. Yes. Yes, uh, have I taken away your remorse and self-reproach now? Yes. You've done that. Who will take away that fear? Fear? She now would have done it for one kind word. Fear of what? What do you mean? And, and what has Regina got to do with it? Is it very late, Mother? It is early morning, Miss Home. The dawn is rising over the skies, and it's all clear and bright now. Soon you will see the sun. I'm glad of that. There may be many reasons for me to be grateful for and to live for. Yeah, I should hope so. Even if I'm not able to work. You will soon realize you will be able to work, my boy. You no longer have those painful, depressing thoughts to brood over. Yes, yes, it's a good thing you've been able to rid me of those fancies. If now we could, we could overcome this one thing. Let's have a little chat, mother. The sun is rising, and now you know all about it. Don't feel the fear any longer. I know all about what? Mother, isn't it that you said this evening that there was nothing in the world you wouldn't deny me if I asked you? Certainly, I said so. And will you be as good as your word, Mother? You can rely on it, my boy. I have nothing else in the world to live for but you. 
Yes, yes, okay. Well, mother, I know you're strong-minded. You have to sit and take it over quietly when you hear what I'm going to tell you. Yes, but what is this dreadful thing? You I mustn't don't... scream. Do you understand? Will you promise me with that, mother? You have to sit and take it over quietly. Will you promise me that, mother? Yes, yes, I promise that. Now tell me, what is it? Well, you should know that this fatigue of mine and me not being able to work, that is not really the illness itself. What is the illness itself? What I'm suffering from is hereditary. It lies here. No, no, what's what? Don't scream, no. I can't stand it. No. Yes, I tell you, it, it lies here. No. And any time, any moment, it may break up. This is horrible, Oswald. No, this Do is not keep true. Keep quiet, Oswald. that is the state I'm in. Please. No. I had an attack while I was abroad. It passed off quickly, but then after that, this dreadful, haunting fear took possession of me. That was the fear then? Yes. I'm not afraid of dying, mother. If only it had been an ordinary mortal disease. I would like to live as long as I can. Yes. Yes, Oswald, you must. Oswald, it's, you must live, Oswald. It's so Please, appallingly Oswald. horrible, Mom. To have to, to become like a child again. To have to be fed. To have to be... It's, it's unspeakable. My, my, my child has his mother to tend to him, Oswald. Oh, no. That is just what I would not do. I dare not think what it would mean to linger on like that for years. To get old and grey like that. And, you might die before I do. The doctor said it doesn't necessarily have a fatal end quickly. He called it a softening of the brain or something of that sort. <laughs> I think that expression sounds so nice. You lost know, one. And now you've taken Regina away from me. If she was here, I she would have given me a helping hand, I know. Never! No. He said no. Nothing. When I had the attack abroad, <laughs> the doctor said when it recurred, and it will recur. There would be no more hope. And he was heartless enough to tell you that, Oswald! I insisted on knowing. Because I had arrangements for me. Mother, do you see this? What is it? Morphine. Oswald, my boy! Let them say it up. Give me the box, I Oswald! Not yet, mother. If Regina was here, I would have quietly told her how things stand with me, and she would have given me the last helping hand, I know. No. If she had seen me lying there, past saving, past hope, with no chance of recovery, <laughs> Regina would have helped me out. No, Regina would never have given that to Regina would have done it. Regina was so splendidly lighthearted, and she would have soon been tired of looking after an invalid like me. Thank God Regina is not here before. Well, now, you have to give me that helping hand, Mother. Hi. Who has a better right, baby? I, your mother. Just for that reason. I who gave you your life. I never asked you for that. <laughs> what kind of life have you given me? No. I don't want it. You shall take it back. No, no, what? help! Don't please leave me, where are you going? Help, I'll defend a doctor for you, no, Oswald. No, 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 Oswald, please. No. Oswald. Let me get out, Oswald, please. No, no Let one shall go. Out. No one shall come please, in. Please, no, Oswald. Please, Oswald, let me go. Oswald, please, don't make me do this. I know, don't do this to me, Oswald. Please, please. Ah! Oswald, my boy, why? You were mother's heart to see me bear this unspeakable pain and terror. Let us, let us hope so. Let us hope so. Yeah. And let us try and live as long as we can. Yes. Yes, yes, let us. Is that for you? 
and soon you will get the rest that you need of soul in your home with your mother. And you will have everything that you want. Just like you did when you were a little boy in your time. Then, then the attack is over now. See how, how soon it passed away? I knew, I knew it would. Mother. Look. Give look, me. my son. This was a lovely day we're going to have. Brilliant sunshine. So soon you will be able to see your home again, my boy. Mother, give me the sun. What did you say? The sun. How's what? The sun. How's what? Oswald, what is the matter with you, Oswald? Oswald? Oswald, my boy, what is the matter with you, Oswald? Oswald, look at me, Oswald, do you know me? the interpretation. Thank you very much for being here. 